Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Moon Hoax anniversary. Today we're going to talk about the issues surrounding NASA, um, which I think we've talked about quite a bit. Might review a little bit of just the evidence pool that we tend to look at uh, and the fact that it's been so extensively documented that nowadays I think we feel pretty content that we've nailed enough smoking guns that it's like alright check maybe even checkmate but let's see what happens here so this year 2019 they're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the hoax of landing on the moon now, they're going to tell you that they did, and there's going to be people very angry that we don't believe their completely fucking made-up religion about the moon hoax. We're also going to talk about, very briefly, to start this thing off with, Stanley Kubrick. Because some things have changed since last year, and definitely changed since, I guess, season one or two when I did the episode about Stanley participating intentionally in the moon hoax because I now know in terms of my heart, my soul that that's not the case if he aided any aspect of the moon hoax technology it was without his knowledge and he would never do that because he's not that kind of guy. So last year, in uh, 2017, through a chain of events, which we'll just skip over because there's no value to it whatsoever, I made friends with Vivian Kubrick, his daughter. And some of you might remember Vivian from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Odyssey. She was the little girl that the actor talked to. Never in my life uh, would I have thought I've, I would be speaking to that girl on a regular basis. She's now a woman, of course. She also did one of the most landmark soundtracks of any film I've ever heard, which is the score of Full Metal Jacket under a pseudonym, under or a different name. That blows my mind because that soundtrack, you know, is in line with the Shining soundtrack work that was done and I think goes all the way back to the original Planet of the Apes, which was one of the most landmark soundtracks to ever be put on a film. So she's an amazing person. And uh, I'm just going to make this fairly brief. I'm going to make it brief for a strategic reason, which is her private business is her private business. Uh, she has granted me permission to share what I am sharing. But Stanley Kubrick who again, I, I thought the confession video was fairly convincing for a number of reasons. One, they said that this was a particular actor with a particular name and they never could produce that actor. They still haven't produced that actor. I did some photoshopping of the face and there's some geometry that definitely is very similar, which is why they must have picked this person. The gentleman that filmed it and said that he was a family friend could have been a family friend, but he managed to escape the household name in Vivian's memory. So this guy, for being this big chum, managed to hide in the shadows if he indeed had a relationship at all with the Kubrick family. And he may have had a small relationship, maybe he had a big relationship, don't know. But she pointed out several visual aspects of her father's uh, genetic evolution and said if this was filmed on the last year of his life then this is what he would have looked like and she she pointed me at various um, behind the scenes filming a full metal jacket of all things which is in the 80s right I think it's probably filmed between 85 and 87 and so now I look back and I obviously feel a little stupid with that one doesn't make doesn't make the moon landings any more real but the more I learned about Stanley 
And, and what Vivian does for me is point me in directions where I'm able to do my own assessment instead of just telling me my father was never this way, da, da, da. She pointed out interviews and things, and, and I did more research beyond that, and I'm on board. Now, the conspiracy to get a film started that would essentially engineer the techniques to do this is still very, very real. It's just that Stanley was more concerned with making a film than this conspiracy. He was home in England with his family when this event occurred, and he was just as giddy and as, as excited as anyone. But there's a little catch. Uh, Vivian had a condition, had a condition from, uh, I think she said, well, obviously from birth to about, uh, I think about nine years old or so. I wouldn't quote me on that, but they were, you know, like one of her last big bouts with this is that she could stop breathing at night when she was asleep. And so because of that, Stanley kept her close at all times. She went to the set with him a lot, uh, like for the majority of her life. When they used to film back in the day, his regiment was to come home to the family and eat dinner, unlike the directors of today, which will sit on the set for 20 hours a day and get four hours of sleep. That's not the way Stanley made films based on the conversations I've had with Vivian. But here's the beautiful silver lining to a bad situation that she had to endure as a child. They were together constantly. She would go to the sets, sets with him even when she was too young to understand exactly what was occurring. Anytime he was missing, she knew and would, you know, raise a little cane until she was reunited with her father. And this would be minutes, not hours or something like that. He once went on a meeting one night and uh, she woke up and her dad wasn't there. And there was a, you know, she panicked a little bit because she's like, he's never done that before. So because of her condition... And because Stanley always took the entire family every single place he went. And he didn't like planes, so he would always take boats. So when they would, anytime they go from England to America and back, she was always there. And they were always literally side by side. Best buds. This went on until she was 12 and a half, well past the moon missions. She's born in 1960, so it's very easy to calculate the, uh, the years, right? When she was given permission to spend the night at a friend's house. If Stanley's off filming all this other stuff, one, there'd be a giant gap in her daily regimen of going to the studio with her father. Because this would take a long time, wouldn't it, to figure out all these things. I think it was only on the set of Barry Lyndon, which is, again, way past the moon mission, that uh, he had to work solo for various reasons. I mean, without the whole family next to him. That was it. She was on the art production team of The Shining. And I'm going to share a little bit of The Shining with you and how things went down so that we can dismiss the myths because, boy, it is phenomenal how these things happen. And it does look like Room 237 is part of a conspiracy to admit that he was involved and he's trying to point the finger. But that's not the case. It's not the case, and it's beautiful. I mean, the gift to us is Vivian Kubrick. The gift to us is that she was at these locations paying attention. She's an extremely gifted person in the mind to begin with. I mean, just look at what she uh, participated in. I mean, the Full Metal Jacket score alone is like, to understand the dimensionality of that soundtrack, it, you could teach courses in college on it, in my opinion. Now, you're going to go back and you're going to view other episodes that I did in the past, and I'm not going to take them down, but I'm going to be leaving them out there. So hopefully this episode will clean things up a bit. But she was on the art production team of The Shining. The Shining was filmed, same general location as a lot of his films, in the UK. A lot of you big Kubrick buffs know exactly what studios this, this, these were filmed in, but the hotel was actually built... The interiors were built inside England, which, I mean, masterful craftsmanship, man. It, it just was ubiquitous with the hotel that's actually in Oregon. 
all in the book, supposed to be in Colorado. So what do we have here? We have, uh, I think the first thing that's really insinuated, I mean, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of like little nitpicky things. The, uh, the yellow Volks, Volkswagen, uh, which in the book was red, his was yellow, and they think that's an homage to Gus Grissom, who said this thing's gonna, this thing's a lemon, and it's not going anywhere. But if you dive deep into the film, one of the other big ones was that the Native American artwork on the wall looks like Saturn V rockets. It looks like rocketry, not Saturn V, but you know, rocketry. I grew up in Kansas around Native American art my entire life. Our cities and towns and rivers and counties are all named after, you know, every other city is named after some some Native American tribe, you know, uh, but the counties are definitely, I came from Neosho County. We have Shawnee County and uh, Sedgwick County and a bunch of other really wild names. So anyway, she said that she watched her father pick that artwork out of reference books and that he was extremely busy. So they would set up the books on a table he would come in, he knew exactly what he wanted, and he would just literally go through and either circle it or put a little note in there and say, yeah, this is good, this is good, I, I'm good. You know, it wasn't like a big stress ball of like, oh, I make sure they look like robots, I mean, uh, not robots, uh, rockets, right? So she has very key memories of these moments, and I believe, if I'm correct, she hadn't seen 237, hadn't heard a lot of the conspiracy theories about The Shining so when her and I had the conversation, it was a very candid new thing for her. And she was like, oh, that's, that's not it. I remember that moment. But the big, giant scene is the little boy playing with his toys on the carpet. And he's got little Hot Wheels, and the carpet is shaped like hexagons. We're going to cover that. The kid stood up and had a Apollo 11 shirt on, which is the first mission, which we're about to celebrate the, uh, the anniversary for. That looks suspect. He's metaphorically launching off of a pad. Looks pretty good, right? Then he goes down to room 237. It's 217 uh, in the book. And then they kept the conspiracy going, why did he make it 237? And then, of course, the keychain, which is messed with to basically signify moon room. And 237, if you multiply it times 100,000, is the average miles at the time that we thought the elliptical orbit around the Earth averages out to 237,000 miles. Now, my physics teacher in high school told me 225, which is weird. Because he, he, the joke was, if you drive your car 225,000 miles, which maybe it's the closest uh, distance to the moon, that you've gone to the moon with your car. If you drive another 500,000, put 500,000 on, and you're, you've driven back. Mm, that's 450, I guess, right? But... Oh, that's kind of interesting. So here's the breakdown of how that went down. She was specifically assigned to get the designs of the carpet, to go to London, and her father said very specifically, find, this, find me the gaudiest carpet you can find. Something really loud. She goes, she picks out a bunch of samples, comes back, he looks at all of them, doesn't like them. But they got a deadline, they got to keep rolling here, they got to make this carpet. So she said that another gentleman who was working on the team said, that's okay, I'll just bang something out real quick. He literally banged this thing out super quick in the art room. And the art room is like a bunch of tables. They're all surrounding. They're all together constantly talking to each other. They have all the equipment they need and fabrication. That was rushed over to Stanley. He looks at it. He's like, looks great. Make it. That's where you get the hexagon carpet from. The knitted sweater with the Apollo 11 on it. Boy, isn't that just a giveaway? Well, that was created by a woman, an Italian woman who was a friend of the family, who at one point, Stanley said, you need to work for me during a dinner. This is way, way before this moment. And she's like, I don't know. You know, he's like, come on, you're a designer. You do the stuff. Why don't you work for me on the set? I'm always making my original stuff, my own stuff. I need you to work for me. So this woman had worked on previous efforts and she's sitting in there. And as it's the story is told, she's with her boyfriend and they were supposed to make some unique sweater for the kid because it immediately gets rid of all the copyright problems. And she's looking around the room asking the question, well, what do American boys wear? Because I don't have any clue. And I think as it was told, the boyfriend um, said, 
well, you know, they just went to the moon. Why don't you just do some type of rocketry thing? And so she knitted this thing while talking to everyone, got it done, and that was the sweater. Boom. Finished. Amazing how it infected all of our minds, huh? I was one of them. 237. Biggest conspiracy question in the world about that movie. Why 237? Well, most of you have heard the front front end story, which was the hotel called because uh, they asked permission to use the hotel's you know uh, likeness in the movie, and they said, "Okay, look, we've got a room two seventeen. Don't use that because we don't want anyone to be scared of going to that room." And so we changed it. End of story. So everyone's like, "Well, he changed it specifically to be the Moon Miles, right?" All right. Well. She told me, she goes, look, my father is a fluid, amazing, I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm inserting amazing, but he's a fluid filmmaker. He doesn't really sit and tear up little things like this. And so he just changed it to 237. He says, well, just make it 237. The hotel didn't call and say, please use this alternate number, which we don't have on our roster for in ter- terms of rooms. And so it was changed without any spe- specificity. It was just changed, and that was it. And later on, of course, uh, they ended up really having a room 237, and it was like, okay, well, the movie's a total landmark in movie history, so, you know, I guess we probably have more people coming to the hotel just to see it and, and stay in it because of this movie. I don't know if the interior <laughs> looks anything like the film. I would assume not, but maybe it does. I don't know. But the, uh, the Kubrick Confession said um, that he met with Nixon, 11 months before the anniversary, which puts him in America, in the White House, in, I guess, uh, July, so you go August, September, somewhere in September, October time frame, he would have been meeting with Nixon, as the confession video said. Again, no one's really claimed this confession video besides the guy he said he filmed it. All these people saying, you don't believe that, do you? And I'm like, well, help me out not believing it, man. You know, it's funny. But Stanley was in England at the time with his family because there was only one trip over to promote 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was in the uh, spring, winter, spring, early months of like the April, March, April time frame in 1968, which would have been the year before. Same year he was supposedly later on going to the White House, sitting there having this big meeting with Nixon. As far as what Vivian believes about the moon mission, you'll have to get it out of her um, communications to the world. I am not speaking on her behalf of what she believes at all in that situation. You know, maybe at a future time, her and I can get together in an episode and, and we can discuss whatever she currently believes about that whole thing. So this is not getting into any of that information whatsoever. And you need to know, I'm giving you a, an extremely paraphrased version of the life that I worked out with her because her and I went year to year to year, and she is actually um, interested in proving it even further. And not not because of anything other than just, it's just a, you know, I mean, she's a very strong person, you know, whatever, people are going to think whatever they think, she understands that. Anyhow. He's clear. He is clear of participating in this in any conscious way. Now, we know that NASA employees actually worked on 2001 A Space Odyssey. They were designing the suits, especially the helmets. The helmets in that movie, if you go watch the Tyler Cinema guy, he, he managed to find the original videos of the NASA guys briefing the press about the designs of the helmet. And they're ingenious. They have little hard drives in them. It's ingenious. So they were all over this production. 2001 A Space Odyssey also mastered front projection. Um, I mean, to the extent that they still had those retina, the retina reflections and the animals, which the, Stanley just said, that list looks cool. Let's just keep it in there. Later, that technique was used in Blade Runner to signify a replicant. I don't think it was necessarily front projection, but for whatever reason, it was in the film, right? So, 
we have a very tumultuous situation in the United States. It's not horrendously bad. We have a lot of big corporations that are engaging in some shenanigans, trying to keep some of us from communicating with the world. This particular channel is definitely suffering from being removed from organic search. Luckily, other search engines are, so DuckDuckGo tends to not have a problem finding the related videos to anything you look up. I think Bing, for the most part, is still playing normal ball. But the other big, big one that owns this channel, owns the, uh, the other big media channel that we all use, they're not even hiding it anymore. They're violating our First Amendment and saying, what are you going to do about it, big guy? And, of course, we're sitting here going, come on, Q, get the thing going here. We're coming up on this anniversary. And the big question is, how hard do we throw down during this phase when there's going to be a big party about a event that didn't occur in totality? The NASA organization of, ni- of the 1960s and early 70s has most likely completely been overhauled four or five times between then and now. So do we need to... Do we need to call the current employees any names? The answer is always no. We don't need to call anyone else names or anyone names necessarily. We want to go to the moon. Most of us, right? When NASA just announced, as I did the other video, that in 2024 they're going back to the moon. And isn't it weird that no one is saying anything about that in the mass media? I mean, think about it. Going back to the moon, and their mission statement is like, we're there to stay, we're building space stations, space bases, and... Oh, really? Wow. Sounds pretty amazing. Sounds like, again, right before our very eyes in HD, we're going to see man strike a stone. Because if you really look at the moon missions, and you liken it to starting fire for the first time, It's not quite as awesome as fire, to be honest, because fire led to us controlling fire, led to us being able to control the development of societies, like figuring out how a seed works in the ground or figuring out how to build a shelter or a water well. Those are very catalytic moments in human history. But getting to the moon, if they had really been there and continued to go back, working out the kinks in the platform, optimizing the platform, Figuring out what's there, what they could build with the materials that are there, how much stuff you got to bring, what are the repercussions on the human body, because there is some gravity on the moon. It could have been the next fire. But in 2024, which is only four years from now, NASA says they're going back. So we're going to see for the first time, like somebody struck this thing six times, Let's just say every moon mission is one fire. And we haven't seen it since 1972. No one has put a man on the moon, an official story, since 1972. And now we're going to go again and nobody cares? Interesting. It'll be interesting during this hypey anniversary that's about to occur and I'm going to try to put this out right on the same day I don't know exactly what day they're going to choose they're going to choose the day he stepped on the moon or the day that Saturn V launched and we'll find out and I'll put the episode on that day this whole endeavor of tracking the hoax and proving it's a hoax and proving all the horrible <laughs> mistakes that they made and again hats off to them for getting anyone to believe this at all that's that's really truly amazing They're obviously were the top minds in the world working together to create some believable scenario. I've said this several times. I say it more and more as of late. People were murdered. Gus Grissom was murdered. And his two companions, his other fellow astronaut friends, they were murdered. Uh, the, The death report on Gus Grissom was that he and the other two gentlemen were poisoned via their oxygen supply with cyanide which is why when they burned up inside the Apollo 1, they didn't try to open it. They, their bodies just were where they were sitting. It was just literally like laying there. Nobody popped the, um, the emergency door, which has got, you know, TNT bolts on it that blows it open. It would have been out in a couple seconds. The other thing is they are in protective suits, and there isn't 
infinite oxygen in this in this compartment. So you would burn it all up and they might suffocate or something. There was maintenance on the inside of the um, the unit before the fire. A little, I've heard it as a toggle switch that was replaced. So you flip it or it automates and there's the spark or whatever it needed to have happen to cover the story. Hell, maybe it's the toggle switch that's the first thing you do to get rid of a fire. You know, And then it's just like fire, pop, but they're already dead is the problem. So there's, there were some murders, above ground murders right in front of our face. And my source on that is my interview with Bart Sabrell, who will, right there in the interview, go look up, you know, deepthoughtsradio.com, look up B-A-R-T. His interview will come up, watch it. It's only about 45 minutes long. And he tells you right to your face, he, he is personal friends with Gus Grissom's wife and son, who's now a commercial pilot, by the way, and that the report on the death of Gus Grissom is about nine inches thick. And uh, it says... What I just told you. So if you don't believe that, that's the official report. Really sorry, guys. Murdered. We have picked this thing apart at every conceivable level, and I'm sure that we have only scratched the coarse surface of what could not take place. What's not happening is they're, they're not going to use the platform from 1969. They're using a new platform, which is the Project Orion, which was turned back on. Having never reported a success, by the way, that I am aware of, it should have been in big, big bold letters in the press, Project Orion puts human beings to the Van Allen belts with no physical repercussions. They won't release the unmanned mission data from Project Orion, which is an unmanned capsule going through the Van Allen belts, coming down, getting all the radiation readings, and then figuring out a way to get around it. No. They won't let that data out. Bart Sibrel went, or Sibrel, excuse me, I keep saying his name on Bart Sibrel. He went to NASA and said, could you please send me that data? It's, it should be, in, shouldn't even have to ask. It should just be published. Nope. It's a matter of national security. Why is it a matter of national security when, you know, a dozen astronauts plus, let's see, plus another half dozen. It was at eight, ten all the six missions that went and 13 which which went to the moon and came back didn't get to didn't get to drop down to the surface supposedly they all went through it so it should come up zero it should be absolutely confirmed the van Bells pose absolutely no human threat but it does pose a massive threat normal solar radiation poses a natural threat Werner von Braun came out a long time before we went to the moon and said the way this is going to work and Disney, Walt Disney Productions animated this. I can't cut it into this video. If I do, it'll get a copyright strike. But he animated what Kubrick did in 2001. They built a wheel in space. They ferried fuel, meaning carried it up there. And then they built a rocket up there, which didn't have to defeat Earth's gravity as much, you know, from being on the surface. And then it blasts straight to the moon lands comes back to the wheel everybody you know whatever takes a shower and then they drop back down to the earth in a different vehicle nope that's not the way it happened saturn 5 magically does magic 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 with its inferior f1 boosters remember russia remember we were rushing against time to beat the russians to the moon in 1973, that with a with a much more powerful rocket, did the math and said we can't go to the moon with what we have. But that went in one ear and out the other because the Cold War was on and Ruskies are inferior, blah 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 blah, and everybody said, well, of course they can't go. They're dumb Russians. Oh, well, there's a little uh, little documentary on Netflix in Russian. You can watch. It's, you can. It's you know. It's translated at the bottom. Where in 1995, we went to this Siberian warehouse where the boosters that were made in 1973 were all stored. They were supposed to be destroyed, but the scientists said, no way, man, these things are awesome. And the Russians had perfected, again, a turbo technique to their motors. Meaning anytime you have unspent fuel that goes through any type of combustion system, the best, way, the best thing to do with it, instead of just throwing it out the bottom as unspent fuel, 
or fuel that will ignite in a way that won't create any type of compression, thus no lift, no thrust, is to capture what doesn't burn and put it back through the engine. And NASA tried. NASA couldn't get it done. But our Ruski friends did. And so in 1995, NASA hears about these boosters, goes and grabs one of them or two or three of them, and said, you know, the Russian government, can I, can we buy these off you? They're like, sure, they're just sitting around doing nothing. And Russia's pretty broke at the time because Yeltsin was selling the joint out. They did tests. Found out that one booster was 2.5 times stronger than the most modern booster NASA had developed by 1995. Now, I'm not a huge walking dictionary when it comes to NASA engines, but I'm going to assume that... And again, the F-1 boosters were not redesigned or rebuilt from 1969 to 1972. So the design of that stayed the same. The platform locked in 1969. I'm assuming that there were upgrades to these boosters between 1972 and 1995. And the Russian boosters were 2.5 times more powerful. It allowed us to miniaturize all of our satellite launches because you didn't need that many motors on the bottom. Hmm. Interesting. If any of you have seen the Russian rocket that they built, it uh, it was formidable as hell, man. I mean, it, it had um, this sort of triangular base to it, which was made a triangle so they could fit more engines down below. Now, NASA's whole excuse was, well, we had an inferior engine, inferior engine, so we put more engines down below, thus counteracting the mathematics. You know, there have been Caltech graduates in their uh, postgraduate degrees that have used simulators to attack various aspects of the moon landing. But I haven't heard anyone try to find out what the F-1 boosters were capable of to then simulate whether or not it could truly escape Earth's gravity, achieve a slingshot. We're going to talk about the slingshot a little bit more here because I pick on it every once in a while. This is one of the greatest hoaxes of the fucking planet, right? But the one that uh, was uh, was on YouTube, don't know if it's still there, was an engineer from Caltech, a kid, you know, and uh, he built the capsule, the little bullet capsule, and he created a simulation of Earth's atmosphere, this thermodynamic simulator, and he threw that capsule at every conceivable angle he could possibly throw it at, at the atmosphere, with the shield out first, right? The bottom of the bullet first. And he published the video of the simulation. And he goes, this thing starts rolling super fast. As soon as it hits, it rolls. There's no way to keep it stable entering the atmosphere with this blast shield underneath. So he goes, I'm not telling you what happened and what didn't happen with the moon hoax, but he goes... With the most modern software in the world that is used to calculate how the 787 would fly. I mean, you realize that thing flew on the first day? That's because the simulation software is so accurate. The 747 took 13 years to, and like, a, what was it, 160 some odd attempts to fly the first time? So that's how good the software is. But you see, look guys, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The astronauts would have been spun to death, absolutely turned inside out as this thing starts spinning at what, you know, 25,000 miles an hour or something. Huge, right? So the hoax goes on. We're in a movement now in this world where the internet has separated the world into a very small group of non-truthers and a much larger group of truthers. But because we are trying to find information, there is another group that tries to disinfo the crap out of everything. And there's two ways to, well, there's, I should say, there's several ways to disinfo something. One is to actually hide the information so you can't get it, which is why all this, all the tapes of the Apollo missions have all been lost. And there's a video of one of these NASA guys saying, well, you know, it's all in this old media and we don't even own the machines anymore that could play it. And it's like, oh, really? Oh, really? The most important thing that man's ever done since the wheel and fire and you don't, you didn't save it. I mean, I got, I got old jazz drives in my house that read an old jazz tape because it has like a bunch of music studio backup stuff on it. 
spare me that you don't have what it takes to read this stuff. So they hide. That's the first one. The second one is that NASA comes up with these websites that have all this debunking. Just basically telling you to go into complete cognitive dissidence. It was that way, no matter what you prove scientifically in simulation software or pure logic. You're wrong. We're right. Therefore, I don't know. Feel like you're crazy? Put your tin hat on, right? And then, the third and most popular technique is repetition of the lie. The most fundamental form of indoctrination, brainwashing, and tribalism to say either you're with us or you're against us and we're going to spend billions in marketing to try and make that smaller group of people who aren't interested in the truth as big as possible hmm that's not working anymore that's not working anymore because these lies are so evident once you see the proof that you can't unsee it and yes, there are some optical illusions out there where you're like, oh man, it's a blue dress. No, it's a white dress with black stripes or, you know, it's whatever. A recent one went around where it was a back of a car and it looked like a beach with a, with the um, sort of the waves, the white caps kind of fizzling out on the beach, but it wasn't. It was the back of a car. Yeah, so you'll have optical illusions like that. But sitting around watching the moon buggy drive around without the human being who's in the driver's seat move one inch beyond just being jostled, the, the, um, the dummy that's in there. is unbelievable. No arm turns the steering wheel to create the turn. It's just happening by itself, like a remote control thing. Uh, these guys were complete jokesters. All of the astronauts had a fun time inside the footage, which is probably intelligence officers, or a pre-recorded um, studio set. And they're playing golf, they're singing, you know, skip through the tulips or whatever. I mean, they're just goofing off like crazy, having fun, which is, in my opinion, up to a point. And get your mission done and get everything you're supposed to be done, but yeah, you should enjoy yourself. There should just be, you know, 15 minutes of, oh my God, I'm on the moon, decompression. Nope. Inside this buggy, nobody waves, nobody does anything interesting. People have done the physics on the rooster tail of dirt that pops out of the back. And they compare it to rooster tails that we do on Earth. And it's exactly the same trigonometry as Earth. Instead of one-sixth gravity, which is, you know, if you ever drive down in, in a Midwest area or an old rural road. For those of you in Australia, you know this hardcore. If you live in the West, you drive and it is dry and you have a plume of clouds up behind you that is, uh, you hope you don't have to hit a stop sign because your car will get utterly underneath this cloud. One sixth gravity in a purely dry world of this soot, it would be like having a still water in a pond and then jumping around in it all of a sudden and hopping out and looking at the water it would be completely full of these clouds. Nope. There's a weird little video of the, of the girl asking Buzz Aldrin, you know, why haven't we gone back to the moon? And unless someone has deep faked this thing to scrub the audio, he flat out tells the girl, we didn't. We didn't go at all. Don't know about that one. I mean, usually fakes are outed, you know, like the original footage gets released and or they do like a really close microscopic view of his uh, mouth or a close up of his mouth. And he is saying something else and someone puts the, the other audio cut and pasting it from other phrases he might have said that day. No, seems to hold the test of time so far. They're trying to play with our minds. And I had the, you know, the... Uh, the deep fake scam episode towards the end of uh, season four there. It's a big deal. They don't want you to trust anything you see anymore. I just saw a new one, which was um, Jack Nicholson from The Shining was replaced by Jim Carrey, the face. They're trying to toy with your brain. 
You know, the funny thing is, for all the young kids that are very familiar with computer-generated imagery, you can tell. You can tell. You need to look, but if you were casually viewing something, you most likely won't see the indicators, necessarily. Especially if you just look at it for a split second, look away, and you're hearing the voice go. And in your, you know, in your mind's, uh, sorry, in your peripheral vision, it still looks like Obama talking, but it's some deep fake simulation. This is going to ramp up considerably from this point forward until they have a crutch to stand on. Now, okay, let's rewind, because I've made several episodes about this sort of thing, but this is under the guise of a moment that's about to occur as an anniversary. So NASA did something pretty bad back in the day. Founded by a bunch of ex-Nazis. Go figure. But what is the deal today? We have an organization with all of its subsidiaries that help them. And... We don't want them to be stealing money that should be going towards a lot of other efforts that we have that need the money. We have a crisis in education. One, we need to redo the entire curriculum of education. That money could be used for that. We have student loans that are absolutely out of control. We should think about that. I mean, you realize the United States government could pay off all the student loans that are out there in a day. Just sign a piece of paper. Yeah, it'll uh, eventually get paid off by taxes, but let's just reset all the kids. But then let's fix the system by which college degrees cost an exorbitant amount of money for crappy degrees that don't yield jobs. So this is sort of some of the basis of the formula of why we don't want these lies to continue. It is sucking us dry. But now let's think about it. If you had a gun to your head, and... uh, the, the God machine in front of us that will tell us the truth about anything, tell us positive or negative, whatever we're asking, it's a true false answer. Would you bet against the fact that NASA and JPL and all their subsidiaries are not creating valuable R&D with that money? Nothing. No patents, no inventions that will help us later on in life. I think most of us would not take that bet against that fact. So they are creating Amazing inventions, and, you know, again, I've said this several times, the people who work for these organizations are beyond brilliant. The trouble with academia is that you could have a very strong left brain. You might even have quite a bit of your right brain. But if you've been rewarded every single time you bought propaganda, when does it stop? I suggest never. It never stops. Becoming a doctor in this, in this world is pretty interesting, isn't it? It doesn't matter where you are in the world. You're taught some true things about the body, and then you're taught some dogma. They have something called dogma theory in, in medical science. It's interesting. And so doctors are only able to go up to a certain point of generating revenue for the hospital that they work at or the practice that they start. They like it because it's a great way of life, hopefully. Hopefully they enjoy what they do. But we know the uh, referral nightmares, at least in the United States, a big giant portion of clinic uh, revenue is simply referring patients from one doctor to the other. In fact, you could be... You know, I helped a uh, plastic surgery company when I first came here. Oh, sorry, plastic surgery uh, clinic when I first got here. They just needed a website. I helped them out. And it, it was just a clinic where doctors would, who were plastic surgeons would come in and perform all kinds of augmentations. And they might, they might only visit that clinic one time in their entire lifetime. But if there was any pre-existing condition that needed to be dealt with, they made money with the referral because like, this isn't my area of expertise. You have an eyes, no throat problem. I'm going to refer you over. And they simply treat human beings like stock chips. And you get referred to the doctor that's going to pay the most for the patient. And then my friends who worked there who referred me to that company later on told me, you know, You never get the best doctor because the best doctors don't have to pay a tremendous amount of money because they have either walk-in clients or a hospital they work for that will give it to them at a lower price. You pay more to establish yourself in the industry. Maybe you get a fantastic doctor, 
but they said that some of the quacks of the world pay a tremendous amount of money because it's the only way they can get a referral. And so you don't get the best doctor. Now, do we need to give NASA a giant black eye in the middle of this great awakening? Eh, probably not. You know, I think we need to sort of let this naturally take effect. I'll say this very figuratively, very symbolically. We have at least one ex-president who is probably involved with some very serious crimes related to uh, an island of which the owner is now incarcerated, about to start his trial. And thank, thank God he pled not guilty because now discovery starts. You plead guilty, you just get your sentence and you go away. It's done. But once you go to trial, because you say not guilty, discovery starts happening, and oh boy, this is going to be a firework show. But now, what if, in the course of that case, this former president... Um, let's, let's, uh, let's button this uh, dude up here. There is a... Uh, feed this into your brain. There's a book written by Douglas Adams. This show's called Deep Thoughts Radio, right? And he had a Deep Thoughts computer that when asked the answer to life, the universe, and everything, it thought for like 11 million years, 7 million years, something like that. And the number was 42 was the answer. And then that catalyzes the rest of the story, which is very funny. So think about his answer and former presidents. And I think you'll know who I'm talking about. What if we got enough evidence to prove that this gentleman was one of the most egregious customers of this enterprise? All right. How will we take care of that? I mean, we don't want to lose face to the rest of the world, right? But justice has to be served. Otherwise, all the suffering from the victims goes unpunished and the justice system fails these individuals. It's sort of like the situation that we have with NASA. Does a kid with a PhD who's 27 years old, male, female, doesn't matter, from around the world, doesn't matter, is it their fault this thing's happening? Or that it happened in the past? Or that current projects are just as nefarious as the ones we're talking about here? Of course not. Wouldn't that be the majority of the employees? Probably. Some people, from an economic standpoint, might simply say, look, man, what do you care about this crap? We're pumping, let's just say, $10 million a day into various organizations that are related to this central NASA thing. NASA takes around six, from what I understand. That goes into the economy. It pays people salaries. What do you care? Do you think they're killing people today as a result of what they're doing? Eh, I don't know. I would say probably not. We have other space organizations like SpaceX, which put out phony videos of uh, Tesla Roadsters floating in space with all kinds of flaws in the footage. A car that would absolutely either boil away or blow up if the second it was you know, released into the upper atmosphere, of which they said they put it, right? In the sun... Parts of the car would be 280 degrees Fahrenheit. In the shadows, it'd be negative 280. But you can bring it down to 250 and it still has a problem. The tires would have to have been solid rubber. Otherwise, if they were remotely inflated, which these were, they would have exploded. What, would have, what outside pressure would have held the tire together? Nothing. If you took everything in your house, or everything, you know, if you're in a car listening to this and podcast, if you're in your home watching this, think about chilling half the room down. Well, in fact, this thing rotated, so let's just do it this way. You take everything in your room, heat it up to 250, and then within a split second, slam it down to 250 below. And I mean in a split second, instantaneous, because it just rotates in the shadow. How many of the items in your house would not explode in that process. Well, whatever they're building Tesla cars out of, we should build the whole world out of because then nothing can hurt them. And people ask me every once in a while on uh, the side channels what I think about Elon Musk as a human being being involved with this kind of stuff. 
And I would say uh, I don't think he has a choice anymore. I'm not sure he ever had a choice. I think he was doing some pretty benign things, um, making Internet startups, uh, working on a car. It's all pretty straightforward production. But once SpaceX was offered as a way to counterbalance a, uh, a negative margin in every company he's ever started, right? Tesla's never made a profit. His battery companies haven't even started selling batteries to the world, as far as I understand, but they're massively in the red as well. And they're like, look, SpaceX is going to be a complete black book of good, solid ink of income. You're, are you in? It's the thing we're going to throw you. We're really launching rockets. They're going to go up, but we're going to put a bunch of shenanigans in there too. These boosters are going to come back down and land, but no one's going to be allowed to ever see it live. Don't know. We don't need proof. We don't have uh, Mark Dice out there with his phone filming it. I would trust that guy. Certainly would trust myself. It would, it would be great. It would be great to see it happen, you know, quarter mile from where I'm standing, half a mile, whatever, but there's no obstruction between me and it. And I would take my glasses off and use binoculars, make sure it's all there. Yeah, sure, great. And then we're done. That one's one mystery down, one conspiracy extinguished. It would be great. But they're not offering, are they? Their launches look like ridiculous made-for-TV shows and, you know, Saturday afternoon matinees where little kids are just yelling and screaming, oh, God, I'm so glad, you know, like they care whether or not a separation works and they're screaming and yelling, just utter fakeness. I mean, I, I almost get sick to my stomach watching those guys yell and scream because I'm thinking, this is all fake, man. And the kids in the studios don't have any clue. No one's going, by the way, this is all fake. When the, the applaud sign comes on, uh, you know, applaud. You know, it's just indoctrination. And now those individuals will go out for the rest of their life and think, I was a part of something special. And you go, by the way, that never, those things that you're, not, not all of the things, but a lot of things that you're yelling and screaming about were fake. Oh, fuck you, man. Ba -da 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 -da, right? It's part of that third strategy of creating a bigger pool of morons. I'm not saying those people are morons. I'm just saying that you teach them things that aren't true. But again, let's talk about the slingshot theory a little bit with Saturn V especially because I've covered this once before. But I've further found ways of convincing you that this is fake. We have uh, recently in the last five years, NASA has claimed to put orbital reconnaissance satellites around Jupiter. Now, again, part of that is probably just on, at its face value, complete BS, finding a stellar body from a rocket that launched from Earth. You know, what is it using as a guidance system? Yeah, there's a bunch of mathematics, but you have a problem that Jupiter's hauling mega ass in the solar system, and you absolutely have to catch up with it. And if it's coming at you at a super fast speed, getting in an accurate orbit around it is... It's just like, my God, it's like, it's like uh, throwing a piece of thread across a, a backyard and it threads itself in a needle. It's also being thrown at you the other way. You know, it's like, it's an absurd level of accuracy that I do not believe under any circumstance we have. And I'll tell you why. Those Patriot rockets that we were building and the ballistic missile shields that we've been building failed for so many decades, right? Where they have a missile coming in and they have another missile that comes up and hits it. It's pretty accurate nowadays, but it still has a bunch of flaws, which is why they do it in three tiers now. You know, there's one, it's like two or three different levels of rockets will keep firing at the thing to knock it out of the sky. Well, according to NASA, there's no need for that. What do you think's harder? Catching up with Mars? catching up with Jupiter and Saturn and all these other planets. They're so far away, they're little dots in the sky. M hundreds of millions of miles away, okay? And we can barely hit a missile out of the sky. So that's one thing that's just right there in your face. Come on. Was it military's not getting the data out of NASA? Come on. If anything, military, covert, black ops, skunk works stuff is being given to NASA. If, any, if there's any pipeline in one direction, it's that direction. And the military can barely create these things. But go back to the one, I forgot its name, I should look it up, but 
The reconnaissance satellite that went around Jupiter when NASA released their CG of how it was orbiting Jupiter, they did a slingshot, uh, a descending orbit. So on one side, it's very, very close to the, uh, to the planet. And then it goes way, way, way out. And then over time, that diminishes. The loops gets closer and closer and closer. And it's taking pictures every time it gets close. And then it eventually plummets into the atmosphere of Jupiter and it's gone. Good. At least that illustration makes sense with the slingshot theory. But how many of you remember, especially in the 60s, you old timers who still think we win, if you're still there? When they did the slingshot theory illustrations way back in the 60s with very proficient, amazing artists and animators, the Saturn V is always illustrated going around the Earth, and then they just say it magically slingshots towards the, towards the moon. That's how it's able to escape the Earth's gravitational force. Something Von Braun said was not possible with the size of the rocket, which is the Saturn V. Hence his firing in 1974. I mean, this guy is like the reason why we had fire. If you think of the moon missions as fire, he's the reason. And he's like, that won't work. But of course it works. So in order to create a slingshot from our home planet, you're going to have to launch, and then you're going to have to gradually increase your elliptical orbit in the opposite direction. Around us, we have to somehow fire some sort of propulsion system that's going to increase into an elliptical orbit such that when it comes back to Earth, it's going faster and faster and faster. And then you're going to have to break away from crashing into Earth. And remember, elliptical orbits always tend to get thinner and thinner and thinner. Remember, you hold a rubber band out. It's, you can make it, you can hold a rubber band in a way that you wrap it around um, a toilet paper ring little cardboard thing in the center and it's perfectly round and then if you want to grab it and pull it into an elliptical orbit shape it gets thinner in the middle the orbital center gets thinner the radius of this ellipsis gets thinner so in order to compensate for an you know the elliptical orbit getting closer and closer which makes it slam into the surface of the earth you need a lot of power all this stage rocket stuff that we do well, by the time the thing gets in orbit, especially all the SpaceX Falcon 9 stuff, you got a little tiny engine on the back. Oh, yeah, it glows, you know, the big famous shot where it's glowing hot, whatever. It's going to need a lot more power. And, I, I, you know, we're not fighting the Earth's atmosphere, so it's not going to be quite a full Saturn V in space. You don't need a first stage up there. But you're going to need a lot more than what they're telling you. And this thing, this... Uh, Apollo capsule that goes to the moon, it's not remotely equipped with that sort of thrust. It's not. And that's one reason why this thing stinks to high heaven and all the other missions to other planets stinks to high heaven. Uh, someone recently told me, and I can't remember who it was, was saying to me that, um, oh, I know who it was. Yeah, a very good friend of mine. He was telling me that uh, he, re he was reading some book and and then watch some conspiracy videos on it. And he's a very brilliant person. And he, he's very into the uh, UFO alien thing. He completely believes that they're here and that sort of thing. So um, just to kind of preface that for you. But he had read this book about this giant war that happened on the surface of Mars. And the reason why it's all iron dust now with no life on it. And again, who knows what the hell we know about that place. But... NASA has given us a full uh, surface rendering of Mars. You can do Google Mars and you sit there and run around on Mars. It's, it's interesting. But there's this big gash down the center of the equator line, or close to. And he said that gash is a part of the big war that happened because it makes no geological sense as to how it exists. And I started thinking about that. And I was thinking, well, you know, I believe in expanding Earth. Perhaps the gash is uh, part of ex expanding Earth. But the more I looked at the simulators, which, again, probably a thousand percent fake, it goes down really quick like the Grand Canyon. It's way, way bigger than the Grand Canyon. It's probably a hundred Grand Canyons and much deeper than the Grand Canyon. And so 
expanding Mars, eh, eh, you know, it should expand slowly over time and fill in the gaps like we have here on Earth. And then he proceeded to tell me how the Grand Canyon was formed by a rushing river. Now, a river runs through the Grand Canyon, for sure. Whether it suddenly ran so intensely monsoonish that it could gash a big giant crater out of the ground, which is the Grand Canyon, doesn't make any sense to me. I think that's expanding Earth. It tore. And then water got in there. So everything's working together to create this big gash. One of our listeners reported in this morning, uh, he said that, you know, with the, with the most aggressive telescopes that we have on Earth, including this uh, telescope arrays, he said that the closest that we can see things on the moon is 90 meters. I guess per pixel, without putting a reconnaissance vehicle up there to take better pictures. Well, the pictures of the lunar landers are completely wrong. But they'll show you those pictures and say, see, man, that's proof we went to the moon. It's like, no, it's not, buddy, because that, uh, that lunar module kickstand that's still there, that limb kickstand, is four times as big as the real one. Sorry, buddy. So all those little trails from the, from the buggy that's up there, they're all four times too big. Big problem. Everything falls apart. And what's funny now is I think we've reached a sweet spot where nobody cares anymore about trying to find more evidence. When you get in a conversation where someone is going, oh, we didn't go, and they're interested in knowing, it's not as exciting as it used to be to take everyone through everything. One, they get overwhelmed really quickly because it's just so much, and they're not able to... You know, I usually try to use pictures, and so I'm like, okay, well, look at this, look at this, look at the blue marble shot, look at the uh, Red Sea on the first Saturn V, or what is this, All right, Saturn V, the first um, Apollo 17 picture of the Earth from space, the, the Red Sea is completely screwed up, because it's a composite, because it's not real, again, they said it's a snapshot, should be, should be, you're, you're far away from a ball, you take a picture of a ball, it's all in one shot, big deal. Nope, it's a composite of a bunch of high-altitude airplanes, jets, whatever. And someone did a brilliant job stitching the thing together. But then you launch Google Earth, and you rotate into the same position as the blue marble, and you have uh, the continents are completely the wrong shape. They're distorted, they're wrong. Now, whether or not you take the Peter projection map, which is the true proportions of all the uh, continents on Earth, all the globes on the Earth are wrong unless they have Peter projection accuracy on them, then it's going to be wrong. So is that proof? Well, what's funny about it is I think that um, the blue marble has the opposite distortion. What should be happening is that since Google Earth matches the globes... Madagascar, which is off to the right of Africa, which is what this shot has, is too far up on the, if I remember it right, it's too far up on the blue marble, and it's much further down in Google Maps, which is Peter Projection. It'll be even further down. So most of us think the jury's in on this whole thing, and we're going to endure this weird celebration. And, you know, what's interesting about it is there's, I don't know if there's anything like it in American history. Or world history as Americans perceive it, because I can't speak for anyone else. Is there an event that we celebrate or mourn or whatever that was completely, completely fake? I mean, Pearl Harbor was allowed to happen. That's official history now. It was a, an FF. That's not the same. We still mourn the deaths of individuals that died. At least we're paying respects to those that were sabotaged by Roosevelt. But we're celebrating footage that was shot in a studio. As if we actually went to a place we didn't go. And let me remind you, China has said they've been there twice now, at least, right? So one on the light side and now one on the dark side. And their photographs are utterly hilarious. It's bad enough their spacewalks have more bubbles than a 7-Up commercial. 
but their terrains the first terrain i saw on their first landing was looked like it was just up in the hills in china brown dirt everywhere with little ice caps on the ground oh wow really there's ice on the moon surface interesting but well, never no one ever talked about that and by the way all the pictures from the moon in six successful missions supposedly didn't have any brown soil didn't have any ice caps anywhere and then their second mission was to land on the dark side of the moon. Well, I think that even in official truth science, the dark side of the moon is pockmarked unlike the light side, meaning the sheer ratio of these little burpy plasma craters that are all over the back side is way more intense than the front side. What do their photographs look like? Pretty much smooth brown soil and what's funny about the brown soil photographs is that if depending on which ones you find you'll find the brown soil ones and then you'll find updated ones same exact shot with gray volcanic dust or whatever they use in the first missions here on earth trying to cover up the fact that china released some pretty bad simulations of what the moon looks like what blows my mind about the China's space program is that when you look at the construction of Chinese buildings, especially the one in Australia that they think they're going to have to tear down, it would seem that they're unable to connect a wall with a ceiling. I mean, like they were taking this, this famous building in Australia. If you look it up, it's, it's like um, uh, skyscraper to the billionaires is now in jeopardy of, you know, it's been fully condemned. No one's allowed to live there. Their squatter's still in there, but they're not supposed to be there. But they took off the ceiling tiles and found out that walls were going up and not connecting with the support beam above. Well, go on, you go find your friends who are architects and say, um, <laughs> is cement, poured cement important within the steel girder structure of a building to add more integrity to its form? And I think they'll say yes. I just watched another video where a building is has been completely built and they were shoveling this paper mache concrete that was poured all over the building to hold it together because it, it had too much water in it most likely and or not enough water. I'm not sure what happened. It didn't turn into cement. It turned into like this gray dust. There's the galleries of all the Chinese construction where you have crazy, you know, uh, you know, windows in front of, of telephone poles and balconies that can't go anywhere and all this other stuff. So it would seem that they're, you know, they're a few decades, if not half a century or more, away from achieving first world standards in construction. You know, we'll overlook all the fact, all the videos of these people getting chewed up in machines because they don't have any safety regulations over there in a lot of places. But this is supposed to be a country that's just barfing out moon missions and and you know space stations and all this other stuff but again their space station footage has the most convincing internal water chamber mistakes of any footage we have we have them too in our situation but they tend to you know we're a little more polished we've been doing a little longer the iss is really confusing because there's some footage that looks utterly convincing where you get a tour of the ISS, the camera never shuts off. And the, the woman with the black, you know, frilly hair, she um, is just going through chamber after chamber, turning corners. The camera never turns off. And you're like, God, how would they do that? Because this chick is not CG. How would they do this? You know, they did the movie Gravity, which seemed to reveal a lot of the plugins created for a lot of this fake space stuff in a movie. Well, Sandra Bullock's body was CG'd pretty much entirely until she got into a capsule with uh, George Clooney and then you could see real life action footage but they show you the making of the movie if you watch it but then we have obvious AR VR we have um, you know one of the astronauts is spinning this um, little furry doll and the cord that it was on stressed out and it flipped back the other way and she grabbed it real quick and then she looks off camera Who's she looking at? You have the guy in the black harness in the T-joint. Two guys are talking to the kids down, down on Earth, and there's a T-joint in the tube behind between the two of them, and a guy flies by on a black harness. What was that all about? 
I've never seen a tour of the ISS where they say we use harnesses to make sure that we don't bang into the walls. They should say that. They should say we put harnesses on when we talk to you guys because it keeps us more stable. All these loop-de-loops these guys do on camera and guys reaching over and grabbing their wire and their clothing, you know, pulls like this, pulls out from their body because there's a wire attached to them. I don't know what to, th- you know, there's obviously the guy that went down the tube and grabbed the edge of the um, uh, doorway and popped himself through a doorway in a 90 degree turn. And he starts to lose his opacity as he enters the other tube direction as if there's a blue screen going on. George Bush Sr. going into the uh, hurricane center in Texas, in Houston, NASA's headquarters to watch the hurricane. And on the big projector is uh, one of the astronauts who's uh, in front of an AR blue screen with the grid juggling balls and stuff. And it's all CG. He's real, but they're CGing stuff in on it. And that earlier that week, he was doing that a little experiment in front of kids without the green screen, you know, with the, the blue screen, whatever. Oh, my God, you know, what's it going to take to convince normal human beings that this stuff is not real to a great extent? I don't believe we have secret bases on other planets. I don't believe we have, you know, an ISS running off to do a big Armageddon movie episode. I don't believe that at all. I think that's a cheap way to write a blank check. What else is going on right now? There's the... uh, I don't know why I say this without getting, you know, zapped. There are people that um, research thing, research a lot of things inside that movement that's going on. And one of them came out and dropped this whole, you know, information bomb and said, uh, the press is going to work together with the, uh, the DSers to fake a alien sighting. And it's going to galvanize the world just like, you know, uh, was it Ronald Reagan's speech he did where he talked about, hey, if we had an alien invasion, we would all get under one roof and then we wouldn't be individual human beings in a racist world. We'd be all just human beings and we would be being visited by other beings from another place and la di la la Okay. Well, there's been a lot of press around that event occurring. They're saying that sightings are are up now considerably all over all over the world supposedly i mean there's this there's this uh, picture and i'm not sure i think it could be a million other things but at the at the july 4th celebration at washington dc there's a shot going out towards the washington monument and there's like six or seven white dots all in a row flying in the air and people are like oh my god they came to visit us why would they visit and show themselves and not land or do a little maneuver or something? It doesn't make any sense why there's, there's nothing conclusive about that. My thought was that that was military vehicles with sunlight on them. I could be wrong. I wasn't, uh, I watched a big portion of that, but I didn't see that live or anything. I wasn't there. Didn't hear a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, there should have been a hundred thousand people tweeting the picture that got off their phone so we could see it from a million different angles and proof. I didn't see that. So I don't know. There's a similarity with the legitimate visit from a UFO and, you know, people walking out and going, Hey, you know, Klaatu, Barada, Nikto and figuring out a way to deal with a big untruth being revealed it frustrates me to think that there's people out there in the government that go, well, we're, we're never going to reveal this. We'll lose too much face, so we're just going to continue lying about it. Because what that does is that will mandate a First Amendment problem. Because anyone that continues to study it, reveal it, prove it, will be silenced. And so you clear the swamp out all you want. And governments around the world. But if we're still willing to hide this one secret, then we still have a virus within all governments that participate in it. And because now it seems like NASA's for sale, this whole thing, hey, you got a country and you want to make your people feel, feel good about yourself. Is your leader indicted for crimes? Uh, is your way of managing your people not working out because communism is, is not working out? We'll sell you the whole you know, Acme kit to fake going to the moon. You know, we put probes on Mars, supposedly. 
Now, again, if you had a platform to get to Mars, you would test it on the closest celestial body you can get your hands on, which would be the moon. And if you have this rover that lasts an, an ungodly amount of years, right? What, 17 years now, 19 years now for the, uh, the Odyssey and the other one? Wouldn't you put it on the moon in a nice safe place and then over time on this really small rock that's only 1,200 miles in diameter, roughly, wouldn't you drive to all the moon sets? I mean, I'll drive to all the limb kickstands and drive up to the rovers that are up there and drive up to where all these people spent their time and where we made history. You would if you were really doing it, but you don't if you're lying. And that's what we have, a lie. A lie that needs to be dealt with. I can tell you right now that um, NASA's pulling out all the stops on this 50th anniversary. The amount of people that they've contacted to be a part of this thing is huge. And so mm, you think, okay, well, let's just say we all sat in the Pentagon and we came up with a plan to reveal this. And uh, it's, it's something that's going to take a little while. We're gonna, we got a 10-year plan. We don't have a two-year plan. We got a 10-year plan. Well, a couple things you wouldn't do. You wouldn't uh, skip a celebration. You would have to have the celebration. You would. But probably what you wouldn't do is say you're going back in 2024 to stay and build space stations. You probably wouldn't launch a brand new lie. Now, have they figured out a way to get there? I don't know. We'll never know because um, they're not going to tell us. So something we have to deal with. So... This is another uh, little bonus episode. It's happening in the summer of 2019, so I have to do it out of the pocket of the, the new show. new show is going to feel like this show. It's just going to be better subjects, I think. But anyway, I wanted to throw this out there to get your thoughts. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what you th- what would you do. What would you personally do? I think that's important. If you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. It's completely redesigned. It is now getting a lot of traffic. It is three times the traffic it used to have because it has a search field. It has a category section. All the links for video and audio are up there. All the links for our social media is up there, which is a locked Facebook group, a Twitter page, which just basically announces the feeds when they come out. Two ways to donate to the pay, to the movement, uh, one through Patreon and one through PayPal. For those of you who are hanging on and the newcomers, thank you so much for joining. There's an all-new remastered Season 1 If you see any of the Season 1 episodes on the website, you're getting the latest and greatest. They've been edited for all kinds of reasons, uh, removing proprietary music, balancing the audio, and cutting out a bunch of pauses and cigar drags and all that stuff. So it's a much better experience. Uh, I'm going to leave the, uh, for now, leave the Season 1 on this channel. So you'll still have the old methods, but a lot of them are not visible in in Europe. So if you're trying to find numbers that don't exist, not every single one of them exists, but 99.9% of them exist, so... Get up there and click on that as well. We'd love to have you join the Facebook group. It's an amazing group of people. Really nice. We don't all agree, but we really uh, treat each other well in the process. So anyway, until the next episode, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.